Tonight is November the 12th, 2018. And I'm responding tonight to a number of the thoughts, requests, and ideas that you guys uh, <clears throat> have posted in the last video about um, what would like to be known about Transformers. Uh, a bit of this is kind of an evaluation of this little LCR tester, which it wasn't intended to be, but that's okay. Okay, uh, one of the questions was, whoops, excuse me, that ought to be a big bump. <laughs> one of the questions um, was, does it measure 4, 8, and 16 ohms on a transformer? And the answer is basically yes, but let's prove that. Let's take a high-end transformer. I'll show you something about the nicer transformers. This is that little James. And it's an 8,000 ohm uh, uh, primary. We set our load here to 8,000 ohms. We put that uh, plate to plate. And um, the series resistance, which I think I've already mentioned, and ESR are exactly the same thing. Okay. Here's 4 ohms. Here's what it says 4 ohms should be. Let's see, we got to get. There it is, RS. And let's kind of get kind of close to this one. See, it says it's 3.9 ohms. This is at 1 kilohertz. Here's 8 ohms. It says that 8 ohms is uh, 8.5. And it says that 16 ohms is uh, 15. Okay, there you go. It does work. Just blows me away. Sorry about kicking the stand there. I'm going to have to do something about that. Here's that pretty little. Uh, this thing was actually made by Chicago Standard. But it's got a Western Electric number on it. 5,000 ohm primary to 4, 8, 16, 150, and 600. So this will help answer that question. So we'll set our uh, our load here to 5,000, and we can do it the other way around. We can put an 8 ohm, 4, 8, or 16 ohm load out here, 150 or 600 ohm, and measure 5,000 the other way. We can measure it either way, but in either case, we get this. We get essentially the same thing. Okay, there's our 5,000 ohms, and uh, <clears throat> this should be. Uh, 4 ohms. Hope I'm making good connections. Good connections are. Well, whoops. Now we went up to uh, inductive. Let's go back down to uh, ESR, our series resistance, our big R, little s. 4.6 ohms. Uh, let's see. The next one should be. Uh, the wire's not in the way. Let's see, 3, 2 to 3, 1 to 2. Oh, shoot. Okay, it's got to go the other way. Still measured the same thing. There's 3 to 4. I measured it the wrong way, but it, that didn't matter because this is still going to be 4. This is going to be the 4 ohms. 4.6, 3, 4. This should be 8 ohms. Eight point nine. This should be 16. This should be, I believe, 150. 164. And this should be 600. 636. 637.637K. So there you go. So it, it does work. And it works the other way around too. No use in measuring these things every possible way because uh, it works. It's actually very nice. Now, another question was, how does it actually measure a genuine 8 ohm speaker? Well, I've got one right here. Let's zoom back out here so we can see what I'm setting up here. Here's a speaker I use in my radio stuff. 
I guess this is about a 10 inch. Makes me quite a nice speaker. And um, we'll set this guy up here. <clears throat> Here's the uh, wire to it. And let's see, let's go down to 100 hertz. Let's start at 100. 100 hertz. And uh, hook this guy up. These are Kelvin probes, meaning that you can't, you have to make sure that both sides make contact at the same point. You can't just jam them in there and have one of them insulated and one of them touching the metal. It won't work at all. So I just kind of almost did that right there. Okay, this is a hundred hertz into it into a genuine eight ohm speaker. There we go. What is it? I can actually hear it. I can hear it humming. I don't know if you all can or not. Seven point four five. Yeah, I can hear a little bit of hundred hertz coming out of the speaker. It's very slight. I don't know if you can hear that on the camera or not. There's that 120 hertz. I bet you can hear that. That's at a kilohertz. It's it's amazingly pretty close to eight ohms. Ten kilohertz. Can't hear this one. Twenty ohms. Okay. I believe it. I haven't checked it against the uh, general radio device, but I believe it. And 100 kilohertz, well that's, that's ridiculous. 51 ohms, I mean who cares. We're going to do everything pretty much at a, at a, uh, at a kilohertz. So an 8 ohm speaker measures pretty darn close to 8 ohms. I'm, uh, I'm uh, really quite impressed with that. Um, let me think of uh, some of the other questions that were asked. Okay, here's something you're not going to see every day. But I, I made a couple of videos of this. This has got two um, hot water he heater elements in it parallel. Two 16 ohm hot water heater elements in it. Because I needed a, a dummy load that could, that could dissipate over a kilowatt of power. And this guy can. I even have a thermometer over the top. I'll show you a little bit more about it. Any of you guys that have watched any of my videos for a length of time have seen this. But I'll show you again that um, the series resistance is uh, 8.3 ohms. This is a, um, a device. I'm going to have to pick the camera up and show you here a little bit. I can, you can see uh, right here and right here are uh, their heater elements. You can buy them at Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever. I bought these at Lowe's. They're like nine or ten or twelve bucks a piece. I don't remember. They're not much money. And they're 16 ohms. Uh, if you really haven't seen it or really want to know, I'll point you to the video on this so there's no use in a great discussion of it. But the point of it is here, I had to connect two one gallon cans in series. I cut the bottom out of that top one and uh, soldered it and then uh, sealed it off there. Uh, this was a couple of years ago so the same water's in it. I put that thermometer on top so I could watch how hot it was to make sure it didn't start boiling. And it will start boiling by the way if you put a uh, five or six hundred watts into it. But you can see it actually ended up being uh, 8.3 ohms and I measured it a little earlier and it's about 8.25 if you measure right there at the terminals so I've got about another 100 uh, milliohms or so resistance in the uh, in the wires leading up to it but if you really need something that's uh, you know if you're gonna go big time and you need to dissipate hundreds of watts even a, even a thousand watts uh, you might you might want to build yourself one of these. 
Okay, this next piece, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how it's going to turn out or exactly what it's worth, but what I'm going to do is put the, uh, the load back on here, 8,000 ohms, plate to plate, and um, measure what we're going to pay attention to this time is how it performs at different frequencies and what I think I've learned let's see okay that's at 5,000 see that makes a difference I got a 5,000 ohm load on it my 8 ohm load or my 4 ohm load says two and a half I'm going to crank this thing up to 8,000 8,000 and it goes down pretty close to uh, four ohms. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to write all this down because this this video is going to be the documentation of it. But let's just do it at eight ohms, okay? Eight ohms, right there. And what I'm thinking is, can we can we use this device? at this frequency, or not this frequency, but this amplitude le level to evaluate a transformer's frequency response. I think the ultimate test is to load the transformer to the power level. That's going to be a challenge. I thought about doing some power supply stuff in here, but you know, Oh my goodness, it's just so involved and so detailed and so many variables that I decided I'm not going to do that. I have to be so very, very careful, which I think I can be, not get shocked. But anyway, let's evaluate this thing at different frequencies. Okay, there's 100 hertz. And I'm going to show you, you'll, you'll see what, what I'm driving at here in a minute. Okay, this little high-end transformer made by James, which I'm very pleased with. I have a pair of these. Well, one of them is in that uh, uh, 6B4G amplifier. Love it. At 100 hertz, it's very close to seven or very close to eight ohms, 7.7. .7. At 120 hertz, it's going to be the same thing. See, same thing. At a kilohertz, remember it was 7.8 or thereabouts eight and a half at 10 kilohertz it's still eight and a half you'll see where I'm going with this in a minute now 100 kilohertz oh I sure wish this thing would go to 20 kilohertz all right hope all of the people that hope any of the manufacturers that are building this thing will put a 20 kilohertz one in there for us Anyway, and then we got to go to 100 kilohertz because that's what our instrument can do. But it still measures 5.3 ohms. So what does that mean? Well, I'm not sure, but let's do this. Let's, let's go to another extremely high-end type of transformer, not high-fidelity type, but this little uh, vintage uh, Chicago Standard Transformer. I mean, you know, I mean, this is quality. This stuff will outlast all of us. And let, let's put its recommended impedance on 1 and 2. And then we're going to do the 8 ohms, which is 3 and 5. 1 and 2 and 3 and 5. And I'll show you where I'm going with this. 1 and 2 and 3 and 5. Let's go back to 100 hertz. Okay, on 3 and 5. There we go. Okay, at 100 hertz, it says it's 6 to half ohms. That doesn't seem bad, does it? Of course, at 120, it's going to say the same thing. I think they made it at 100 hertz to 120 hertz because of European and U.S. Uh, line frequencies. So that you could see uh, the second harmonic of 50 hertz, which would be 100, and the second harmonic of 60 hertz would be 120. Okay, at... Um, what is that, 120 hertz? It's pretty good, isn't it? At a kilohertz?
What the hell? What am I measuring here? I'm measuring between three. Oh shit. Excuse me. We gotta start this one over. It's gotta be between three and five. <laughs> I can't make these videos but so many times before I go insane. Okay. Forget that first part. There's uh, 100 hertz again. Sorry. 8 ohms. 8 ohms measures 3.4. Seems like it's low frequency and it's not so good. Okay. At 120, same thing. At a kilohertz, measures 8 ohms. 8.9 ohms at a kilohertz. That makes sense, doesn't it? Did you see how low the frequency, I mean the uh, impedance, series resistance, the ESR, went at the low frequencies? It's all making sense now. Let's go to 10 kilohertz. Actually, it still works pretty good at 10 kilohertz, doesn't it? And at 100 kilohertz, which is unfair. Wow, 8 ohms. I don't know. Sometimes this stuff flies in my face. And what I've measured over and over and over, when you do it again, it just flies in your face. Seems like it works really good at high frequencies, doesn't it? That thing is maintaining three, four, five. Yeah, that's the eight ohm tap. Let's do that again. This is this is what you live with when you when you mindlessly and obsessively measure this stuff. So I'm not going to apologize for it and start all over and make everything turn out the way that uh, it's supposed to in a textbook. This is real life. Okay, there's 100 hertz again. I think you can see that clearly. About 3.4 ohms at 100 hertz, 120 hertz, going to be the same thing. Well, it went from 3.45 to 4. The 8 ohm tap now goes to uh, 8.9. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? And, uh, 9 ohms at 10 kilohertz and at 100 kilohertz way beyond anything that it's still darn near 8 ohms what kind of conclusions do we draw from that is it because it's a small transformer because there's seems like it's high frequency response is exceptionally good it's low frequency response seems to not be so good but then that is not taxing the core the, uh, the output of this is about a volt, I believe. Uh, that was a question that was asked. What is the difference between the measurements I'm making with this one and the general radio uh, ZY bridge? This one's about a volt, if I remember correctly, because there are a number of videos made on this little device right here. And the, um, the uh, general radio device, I was driving it at plus 10 dBm with it uncalibrated, so it's a little bit higher now. It's probably about 4 or 5 volts on the uh, general radio. In either case, it's not, it is extremely small amounts of uh, magnetizing voltage applied to the core of the transformer. Okay, let's keep moving. Like I say, life is not perfect and this is what life is like when you <clears throat> measure this stuff. Okay, one and three and eight and nine are the numbers here. Man, it, this thing is solid. See, one and three, this is 3,500 ohm. And eight and nine is the eight ohm tap. One and three and eight and nine. So, let's hook this guy up. Let's set it up at 3,500 ohm. We've got to remember to do this every time. Let me uh, zoom back out so you can actually see what I'm doing. And then I'm measuring, I'm setting this one up for 3,500 ohms. And then 8, 1 and 3, 1 and 3, and 10 and 11. I said 8 and 9, I meant 10 and 11 here. 
10 and 11 and then let's hurriedly go back to 100 hertz okay this is a massive transformer and this should be 8 ohms and it's three and a half okay it's this is this is some of the stuff that I've been measuring so why is this big massive device three and a half ohms and a hundred Hertz at 120 Hertz it's about four and a half at a kilohertz just about everything turns out perfect Oh, please. My God, I turned around. I turned the wrong knob. 3,500. Okay, let's start over. 100 hertz. Okay, 3,500. Okay, I got it right this time. Sorry for the fumbling, but like I say, this is, this is real life. This is the way... So much frustration you have to deal with. 6.6, 3.67 ohms should be eight. Okay. 4.26. Okay, it's coming up. This is this big massive guy. I mean, this is military stuff. This is this is fantastic quality equipment. Well, I've got everything across the wrong damn thing. Okay, we're gonna start over again. It's cause I it part of it's cause I got the camera in the way and I'm trying to stay out of the way of one and three and ten and eleven. Okay, let's start over again. Okay, they were at hundred hertz. Cause when things don't make sense, you just gotta keep checking and checking and checking and rechecking. You guys have probably quit watching my videos, but man, this guy's lost it. By the way, today's my birthday. I'm 69. Sometimes I act like I'm 99. Or sometimes I act like I'm 19. <laughs> okay, there we go. 3.7 ohms at 100 hertz. Oh my God. 4 ohms at 120 hertz. We're going to get it right yet. Looky there. 7.3 ohms. That's pretty close to 8 ohms, isn't it? Okay, 10 kilohertz. 10 kilohertz. Still 8 ohms. Hmm. And 100 kilohertz, which, I don't know, for whatever it's worth, 14 ohms. Not too bad, huh? But back around to the 100 hertz side. 3.5 ohms. I don't really know what to make of this. So we've got a, a massive transformer here. This thing is heavy. This thing is all I can pick up with, 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 with one hand. And it's, uh, it's series resistance is so low. Let's compare that once again. And this time I'll promise you I'll do my very best to get it right the first time. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight thousand. And we hook this from plate to plate and then we hook this from zero to eight and at a hundred hertz hundred hertz make sure nothing's shorting each other plate to plate zero to eight eight thousand eight thousand ohms it's about 8 ohms. These other guys can't do that. They drop significantly when it comes to the low frequency. I bet I don't know why now. I bet I don't know why. You know, this is a high fidelity. 8 ohms. 8 ohms. At 10 kilohertz, 8 ohms, and at 100 kilohertz. Not bad. Okay, okay, okay. I think we're getting somewhere here. So what do, what do we want to measure now? Maybe we should look at the inductance of it. It's series inductance. 
Well, that's microhenries. Well, actually, we don't want to do that. We want to measure its inductance without a load on it. You have when you measure its impedance, you have to you have to have a load either on the primary or the secondary. If you if you're measuring the primary, you have to load the secondary. If you load if you're measuring the secondary, like the eight on tap, you have to load the primary, which is what we've been doing. But if you're going to measure the inductance, you do not have a load on anything. You just measure the inductance. That's actually a good point. I'm, I'm glad that in all my fumbling I actually got to that because if you don't know that and you start trying to measure the inductance with a load on it, you're going to get some answers that just don't make sense. Okay. No, we don't want C. We want L. We want LS. Not CS. Let's see. That's plate to plate. No, that's plate to plate. It is not millihenries. That's probably because one of the one or two of these things are not uh, LS millihenries. Not oh that's at hundred kilohertz, sorry. We want to do it at a low frequency. We'd really like to do this down at 20, 30, 40 hertz. See, I think that's the answer right there. 80 Henry's. 70 something Henry's. That's coming down because I... When you start measuring these things, the more you measure them, the longer you fool with them and tinker with them in a particular measurement session, the weirder they get. If you want to read some really nice documents on um, how to deal with these things, uh, look at um, uh, General Radio and, and read their manuals on it. But anyway, you can see at a low frequency, mostly I measure mine at uh, 40 hertz. You can see it's up at 70 Henry's. I think that's why we have a low frequency response. Okay, thank goodness. Okay, now let's move this guy. Let's move this guy back in. And it's supposed to be between one and three. And we're not going to change anything up here. We're just going to put this on one and three to see what it's. Uh, we want LS though, because the other one we measured in series, not parallel. Yeah, eleven point nine Henry's. hard to see all this little detail up here. I'll blame it on my age. Holy mackerel. There we go. Five Henry's. This one is like 70 Henry's. This one's five Henry's. I think that's where our low frequency response is so much so much improved in the little amplifier. I mean the little transformer here. A high quality one. Probably from a soft core. Yeah, I have spent un hold of hours out here fighting these things. Okay. Okay, let's move to the next one. I had to stop and restart the camera because the time out on me and quit working. I won't even know it quit. <laughs> okay, let's go to one and two over here. Let's see what the uh, inductance of this primary is. L S Henry's five Henry's. So I think we can easily conclude that you need a lot of inductance for good low frequency response. Seems like they all do pretty well at high frequencies, and you know what? That is something that I have indeed experienced. The high frequency response of a lot of these amplifiers that I have built, and I've probably built just too darn many, I probably should be doing other things in my life besides building amplifiers, vacuum tube amplifiers, but I have noticed that the um, they sound marvelous. The high frequency response, though, is really good. Actually, the low frequency response is pretty darn good, too. 
but probably most of the low frequency is, is, is certainly not down in the 20 hertz range, probably down in the 100 hertz or so range, you know, most of the, the booming of, uh, of drums and, and what have you. So what do you think about those apples? Life just doesn't turn out the way the textbooks tell us, does it? And making these measurements is just sometimes just fumbling and trying to make sense of it. And you get answers and you think you did everything right and then you go and check and check and recheck. You gotta do that. It's, you're endlessly checking and rechecking your, uh, your data. And after a while you go, what? That doesn't make sense, and then you you realize you made some really stupid error. No, everything these last ones have have, have worked. 100 hertz, 100, 120 hertz, kilohertz. But back at the kilohertz, up there, it's even 3.8. Now, inductance. The inductance value of this transformer is not frequency dependent. Inductance is not frequency dependent. Inductive reactance definitely is frequency dependent. And the and depending on the size of the reactor, the uh, inductive reactor absolutely depends, will uh, make the frequency that you measure it with extremely important. If you try to measure a one micro Henry choke at 100 hertz, it's not going to work. If you try to measure a thousand Henry choke at 10 kilohertz, it's not going to work. It, it's, it, would, it would be like uh, it would be like taking this meter right here trying to measure a micro ohm. You need a completely different kind of meter. Or it would be like taking this kind of meter and trying to measure 100 gig ohms. It's not going to work. But if you take the 100 gig ohm measurement and try to measure the things, it's not going to work. So you got to have the frequency that you measure your inductors at are extremely important. I'm going to show you something else here in just a second. Here is a really nice pair of line transformers, and I need to do a whole lot more research into line transformers, but I'm going to show you something. This is just kind of a, let's see, this size says 0, 2, 4, 8, and 15 ohms. This side says 0, 500, 2.5 M, 1 M, 1.5 N, and 2 M. Well, I have some uh, old Collins radio equipment made back in 1947. Now I don't know the date that these were built, but they could have they could be that old. And if you run across uh, transformers and chokes that have an M on them, M means K, means 1000. It's the Roman numeral M. You know like the year 2000 was MM. So if you run across this stuff and you see M on it, you know it's vintage. And uh, it actually may be very good quality. These measure out very nicely on this device right here. Those would be some really dandy uh, transformers. Um, 2.5K, 2.5M in this case, 2,500 ohms, is uh, not a real high uh, plate load impedance. And I need to do some questions for asking. I need to do a lot more research on um, core saturation on these types of transformers. I think we all agree, and there has been a lot of discussion about insulating uh, the uh, core of these types of transformers with a capacitor. You know. Put the put the uh, put the um, DC source to the output tube through a, a resistor or a coil, so that you don't put DC through these things and saturate their core. 
because as a line transformer they're meant to be like in a PA system or whatever you know what I mean I don't want to get too deep into that and the uh, videos that I've made on core saturation of transformers I think were extremely inadequate because not only do you have a DC component but I think you've got a you've got to uh, include a very low frequency AC component if you want to accurately measure the uh, the core saturation characteristics of a, of a transformer I'm going to conclude this video by uh, talking about a few things that you guys have mentioned, some things that I've learned from you all as I knew I would and I hope that I uh, provide some information to uh, the viewers. I thank you all very much. Really appreciate uh, the engagement. But one of the things uh, I want to show you about power supplies, so we're kind of switching from audio back to power supplies here. There's basically, well there, there's three kinds of filters. You know here's our Here's our input. We got a fuse, a switch. This is going to 120 volts AC or whatever. This is our plate load. And in this case, we're going to ground the center tap. Forget to draw that in there. You can, one, you can put a capacitor out here. That can be your entire filter network right there. But that's not going to be a, the best one, that's for sure. Okay. Then there's another type. And it's a I refer to it as a choke input and it has one capacitor to ground and this is your DC output now the DC output by the way I, I need to very seriously mention this these results that we're getting are only and they must have a load out here because if there's no proper load out there whatever your amplifier might be then uh, your everything's going to be open circuit and everything's going to be out here everything's going to be the, the square root of 2 which is approximately equal to 1.414 times whatever the voltage from here to here is so it has to be loaded so if you build this you don't put the load out there all your numbers are going to be the same every time but anyway that needs to be said but we don't want to dwell on that because we know this is true Okay, with this type of a filter, let's say the voltage across here is 300 volts. With this type of a filter, you're going to get approximately 90% of this 300 volts. Which is going to be 270 volts, or thereabouts. Now, if you put in another capacitor here, you're going to get approximately... 1.25 times the 300 volts which is going to be 400 volts quite a bit of difference isn't there now what I learned just in this short discussion we've had so far is if you tune this capacitor right here the values of these these right here um, there's some simple formulas I don't want to go over because I'll just get into just some nitty gritty math and a calculator and all that kind of stuff. But let's just take, for example, something reasonable 10 Henry's, uh, 40 microfarads. You don't need 400. You can have it if you want. This one right here is very important. See, because remember, if we take this guy out, we got the 90%. If we put a big one in, if we put another 40 in, we got 1.25%. See, the 90%, we went to 125%. So we're going for 270, 400 volts. But a, a couple of you guys have talked about tuning this capacitor. And then instead of making it 40 microfarads, maybe it needs to be something like a 0 0.5 microfarad. You know, like a point. 040, uh, excuse me, like a 0 0.47, like a uh, 0 0.47. I have never tried that, but that is really interesting. Now, I do not know how 
the very load out here is going to change it. Generally, I assume my load out here to be about 40 watts. Okay? And we know that power, I'm writing all over the board here, I don't have to start erasing some of this stuff. We know that power, uh, W, watts, equals E squared over R. So if we do the uh, algebra here, we get R equals E squared over W. So if we got 400 volts squared over whatever our watts is, 400, that's going to give us the value of our R. That's, that's, that's the equivalent resistor load of our entire amplifier. And that's what you need to put out here to do this testing of what you can expect. So this right here, that's why I write this in here like as a variable capacitor. You're probably not going to be able to vary, you know, it's certainly not going to be able to put in a an air variable capacitor and tune it in like that. But that's that's something that fascinates me. Now, there's another one. Here's another interesting thing. I gotta take a I gotta take some of this stuff out draw this. Let's suppose, I'm going to take this out too because we know what all this means but we're not going to be using it. What about if we put in a pie filter here? You know why it's called a pie filter? 40 microfarads and 40 microfarad. It's because this right here is supposed to look like that pie. That's how, it gets, that's how come it gets that name, these three components right here. By the way, I don't know if you know this, if, if you see this in here, you see how that's grounded and that's grounded? The effective circuit here looks like this. That's what it looks like. You do not want to make this like uh, 1.7 Henry's. This is in all the ham radio books. And I don't remember what the value of the capacitor is. It, it's pretty small. But if you make, you, you do not, I don't think you got much to worry about because these kind of values are not very likely to happen. This, I think this ends up at about 2 microfarads, which would be a 4 microfarad here and a 4 here in series. You know how all that works. Because you do not want this resonant at 120 hertz because all hell breaks loose in it. That's what they say. Anyway, so let's build this one where we got 1.25 times this voltage. So we've got 400 volts out here. Now what if we put in another, a completely different vacuum tube in here? I hope I can draw this without fumbling too bad. And we put it across the same, the same wires, the same transformer. You see what I've done? I've put the two parallel. This tube and this tube, as far as the plates go, are parallel. Except here on this one, we put this one into a choke input filter. So now we've got only 90% of this volts, which is our 270. So on the same transform, by adding another tube, of course, you've got to have another filament winding. You gotta light the filament on this one separate from the filament on this one. But up here we've got 400 volts and here we got 270. This is really cool when you think about it. Because what what does that allow you to do? That allows you to run your 6L6 or, and your 6550 KT88, that kind of tube, as actually a beam power tube, which is essentially a tetrode. Because in, I'm gonna erase all this. In, in inside, if, if you look at the uh, at the data sheets in the um, for a six L six, oftentimes I just draw it like this. It looks like a tetro, and it's actually sort of is because it has this thing internally connected to the to the third grid, the suppressor grid. It's called a suppressor grid. It's called a screen grid. It's called control grid. Cathode, indirectly heated cathode. 
and if you do the ratios, if you if you study the tube manuals, you'll see that the ratio between these two, if you want to run it at really high power, you get a little bit more distortion. But if you, you can run this one at 400 and this one around 270, and you'll get it's a whole lot more efficient. And our darn near every one of us, all of us, look. In case you haven't. This isn't obvious. When you do this, and even if you run ultra linear, this is your screen grid. Your control grid's up here. You're driving it over here. This is your screen grid. You're connecting it to a UL tap. The voltage on the plate and the voltage on the screen grid is the same thing. I mean, they're very like two or three volts or whatever. They're the same voltage. This is actually a triode connection. I don't care what anybody tells you. This is you, your tubes are acting like a triode, which is good. That's not a bad thing, but the efficiency of it is certainly less than a tetrode or a beam power tube. If you've looked in any of the manuals of uh, vacuum tubes, they do. A, uh, RCA does a beautiful job of showing this. They show the plate like this, and then they show. Um, they show the third grid built something like this. I'm a terrible artist and I apologize for it. This is the screen. This is the grid, the cathode. And the cathode is hooked to this thing right here. And of course this one's the same thing. It's a beam forming plate. It's not really a grid. The only tube that I know of in the audio world of power that has three actual grids is the EL34. The EL34 actually has another grid up here and it comes out on pin um, I think pin 1. This is on pin 5, this is pin 8, this is pin 4, this is pin 3. The EL34 is the only real Pen toad. The 6L6, KT88, KT66, the 6L6, the 6V6, the EL84, all those things are, are the beam, have the beam forming plate that's internally connected back to the cathode. For whatever that's worth. Anyway, I better conclude this. This is getting really long. Hope it's worth something. I'm sure there's a few more things to discuss. I love this stuff, just like I guess you guys do too. So thank you again for uh, participating and, and discussing and bringing up the ideas. I've already learned things. I hope you guys have learned things. Um, I try not to go too uh, elementary in, in, my, in, my, in my discussions, and I try not to go over the edge because I'm communicating with a, a good gentleman down in Australia, and we're doing the... Uh, we're putting <clears throat> the data from these other earlier measurements into a uh, least squares curve fit program and trying to figure out and seeing that uh, when you go, when you start using an audio output transformer, let's turn back around so we know what we're talking about. We're not talking about anything that, that's, on, that's on that board anymore. When, you, when, when, when we get back to these transformers over here and we have like 8,000 ohm primary and an 8 ohm secondary. If we change that 8 ohm secondary to 4 ohms, mathematically it would change our 8,000 ohm primary to 4,000 ohms. Or if we had an 8 ohm tap, I'm assuming we only have an 8 ohm tap. I'm not, it's not about this particular transformer. But suppose you've got a transformer that has one 8,000 ohm primary that goes to your plates, push pull plates, and you have a secondary, it's 8 ohms. That's all you got. Well, if you put a 4 ohm speaker or load out here on your 8 ohm secondary speaker winding here, then mathematically your primary impedance goes from 8 ohms to 4,000 ohms. And it basically works. 
or if you change the 8 ohm, if you had your 8 ohm tap out here and you put a 16 ohm load on it, you doubled it. See, in this case, one case I'm halving it, one case I'm doubling it. It's going to do the same thing back to the primary, so you're going to end up with 16,000 ohm primary load back, what your tubes are going to see. At a ratio of 2 to 1, you can cheat it, and I think you can get away with it and uh, have some uh, really good success. Once you go past that 2 to 1 ratio, you're in trouble because it is not linear. It is the best fit that I can get to it is a, uh, is a secondary equation called the quadratic equation of parabola. It, um, it is not linear. So, if you have an exact 8,000 ohms to 8 ohms, that's a 1,000 to 1 ratio. If you change it to 4 ohms, it will not exactly half. If you change it to 16 ohms, it will not exactly double. And the, the difference in just a 2 to 1 ratio is acceptable. But once you go past that, it's not going to work very well. Uh, even in a 2 to 1 ratio where it should be... Uh, doubled or halved, the error is at least 25%. And once you double that again, the error gets to be over 50%. So you can't, you can't stretch it but so far. And that is something that has interested me. And this little device right here has uh, made these measurements so easy. An instrument that is just off the chart gorgeous is, is this ZY bridge. And it'll give you those numbers, but I don't rather. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a beautiful experience to work with it, but it's very time consuming and very confusing. There's just so much data, and there's just so much arithmetic involved that by the time you get through it, you're, you're about half insane. Be safe, gentlemen. Don't get electrocuted. Have fun.